Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's review is Delta Green Control Group for Delta Green the Role-Playing Game by Arc Dream Publishing. In this video I'll be reviewing the third scenario in the book, Sick Again. There'll be spoilers from this point on, so stop watching now if you intend to play this. The adventure begins with a particularly poignant quote by Hippocrates, with the date that everything starts. 21st of November 2012, and then we get into the scenario itself. In Sick Again, the characters are part of a quick response group of medical and scientific personnel that work for the Centres for Disease Control and Prevention, most specifically the Crisis Response Section of the Office of Public Health Preparedness and Response. The experts there work to respond to in-hours emergencies while developing a strategy on how to deal with it. They drop everything and respond when an unknown, highly infectious disease breaks out in Hudson's Well in Arizona. The characters here are not agents, but researchers, and as the disease is unidentified, it is known as Blank Pathy. This will be important later on. The pre-generated characters are CDC associates, and are all on call when the Hudson's Well emergency happens, and they essentially bid farewell to their loved ones, grab their go-bags, and head to Phoenix on the noon flight. It makes the point that the researchers are partially adapted to violence for seeing and working with cadavers, but not inflicting violence. Their direct overseer is Dr. Stacy Marholm. It lists the equipment that each of them have. Their go bags are a suitcase with usual travel items in it, PPE, duct tape for repairing hazmat suits, and a CDC credit card. They have a toughened laptop with satellite access that has a titanium case that can be used as a shield in a pinch, as well as a sat phone and a high end smartphone. The team also has a portable diagnostic lab in several bulky suitcases and a suitcase packed with exotic treatment options and restricted medicines and chemicals. They also have two level A and B hazmat suits stored in a duffel bag. It details the hazmat suits. The level A is described as a smurf blue spacesuit like piece that goes from head to toe. It has a self contained air supply or can be directly attached to one close by. Essentially, pathogens cannot get through it unless it is damaged. The Lever B has treated coveralls, a hood, a gas mask and a tank worn outside. C and D are basically things like gloves and masks that are in addition to normal clothes. The researchers need help getting into the suits and sealing every seam and due to the way it obscures vision, they write their name and blood type on the front and back. While wearing a suit, physical mobility is limited and reflected in skill use and the oxygen tank cannot be changed on a level A without removing the whole suit and has an hour's worth of supply. Running out of oxygen causes suffocation. If the suit is breached, air blows from the inside out in order to push toxins away and should the wearer know it has been breached, it is a small sand check against helplessness. It goes into the process of decontamination, done by workers using brushes, water, cleaning agents and wading pools and the like, and all physical waste is incinerated. We then go into the background. The whole incident at Hudson's Well was started by two retired physicists, Rosamund Kyatt and Geoffrey Langsville, who made an incredible discovery that ultimately killed them. Kyatt's work bled into the fallout of Majestic 12's experiments with the tilling gas resonator, though she had no connections with the group. Her intelligence and evidence caught the eye of the programme and strings were pulled to defund and disgrace her. In 2009, she, along with her husband Jeffrey, moved to Hudson's Well, Arizona, her hometown. She set up a basement lab with her husband as an assistant and on the 19th of November 2012 they made an incredible breakthrough. Kayette accidentally opened a hole in space-time. It had long been discussed that a time machine would only work as a closed loop. It would be turned on and create a beacon that would be energised further down the timeline, creating a temporal bridge between them. When doing this, Kayette, instead of getting a chirp of accomplishment from her computer, was greeted with violent sparks and a visitor. She estimated that the wormhole had been open for 2.21 seconds and was 1.17 metres in width. The entity that came through was a woman. Clearly human, but tall, and only had rudimentary English. It was determined that her name was Thartha. Once calmed, Kayat and Langsville gave her food and drink and talked to her. Two days after Thartha arrived, Langsville got sick. Thartha worked out that she could be the cause of the illness, and was scared she'd be killed as she was the carrier, and not being a scientist, had no idea how to solve the issue of sending her back to her own time. So she killed Langsville to stop the spread of the disease. Kayat committed suicide and Thartha hid in fear. Sadly, Hudson's Well was already infected, though Thartha was immune. The disease itself is called Blank Pathy. 
The researchers need to name it, and again, this is important later on. Thartha is inoculated against it. However, her passage from then to now attracted the microscopic entities that cause it, and she is essentially the patient zero. The entities that cause it are microscopic liquivores from end space that shift between dimensions. They were originally discovered by Crawford Tillengast, though the micro versions are new. They attack nerve fibres and feed on electrical impulses. Those who die from it usually suffer heart failure or cerebral haemorrhaging and remain infectious for around an hour after death. It spreads via proximity, not by inhalation or fluid exchange, but by simply being near and hazmat suits offer zero protection. It lists some circumstances such as riding in the same car or standing in line near someone. So the next page is a briefing that they will receive from Dr. Marholm, their boss. She tells them that at 0800 today, the DPEI took an emergency call from Dr. Fritz Strickland of Hudson's Well Catholic Hospital. He is one of two full-time doctors that work there, and in the last 24 hours, eight patients have been admitted, including two medical staff with symptoms of an unknown pathogen, which has caused four of them to die. She details the symptoms. High fever, nausea, coughing, disorientation, intense headaches and hallucinations. The patients have been isolated and he has asked for assistance. They've been treated with a number of antibiotics that have not worked and Tylenol failed to reduce the fevers. Only cooling blankets have proven slightly effective. They're asked to head there, identify the pathogen, make a treatment plan, find the source of the infection, evaluate the crisis and advise on containment of the contagion. It then details the different stages of blank pathy. At stage 1 of exposure, nerve cells start to fail and a D4 and a D8 are rolled. The first to get the number of symptoms and the second to roll the symptom. Things like headaches, coughing, sensory impairment and uneven pupil dilation. It causes a D4 sand hit and after 2 D4 hours they make a con times 5 roll to see if they stay on this stage or move to the next. A fumble causes brain damage with a loss of 1 int. Stage 2 is where it spreads to the brainstem and they become infectious. They get 2d4 symptoms and roll d10 for each. These can be things such as impaired hearing, taste, respiration or equilibrium, loss of bladder control, sleep paralysis and the like. After a further 2d4 hours, a con times 5 roll is made with the same advancement chance as before. At stage 3, they can start sensing end space, which manifests as strange dreams and waking hallucinations. Roll a d4 for the amount of symptoms and a d4 to find out which ones. These are much more severe. Things like a feeling of suffocating in a black vacuum, drowning in dark water, or falling while being devoured by invisible monsters. This causes a 1 or D8 sand hit from the unnatural, with those who go insane being self-destructive and violent, wanting to destroy their sensory organs. Beyond this, every 2D4 hours following, a con times 5 with a minus 20% penalty needs to be made, with int and hit points being lost at every result. There is, of course, no treatment. Yet. The inoculation that Thartha has has not been created, but it will be someday. The first and second stage symptoms can be treated with medication, and the penalties can be halved with the use of medicine or pharmacy skills. Third stage can only be alleviated with sedation, and they come out of it raving mad. Only a medically induced coma can keep them down. The disease can actually be cured with shock treatment, though nobody has discovered this yet. If a shock of 240 to 250 volts go to the brain while they're anaesthetised, then this will wipe the disease out by severing the electrical connection between the microbes in our dimension. A TENS machine used on the head can also do this, as can a stun gun, though these are both incredibly painful. It must be administered for 10 to 20 seconds. A medicine roll at minus 20% must be succeeded. A failure is a partial success with symptoms abating for an hour or two. A defibrillator used on the head will also be effective, though this may cause enough damage to kill them, as would a power transmission line, though not being grounded will help. If grounded, they become stunned, take 2d8 damage, and die from a cardiac arrest if zero is hit. An MRI will also cure it, though they will take a portion of the brain they reside in with them, which proves devastating, resulting in stat damage. The person who identifies the disease gets the chance to name it. It will otherwise be known as the Unidentified Syndrome. Some formal Latin names are suggested, as are acronyms, or simply a description such as Hudson's Well Syndrome. Whatever it is be called will be its official name going forward. So going back to the story, we begin with the researchers landing in Phoenix to 2pm local time with their gear and heading to Hudson's Well, which is 170 miles away. The researchers will receive a call from their boss, Dr. Marholm. 
She will express her confidence in them, but has a note of concern about how bad this could get, as the spread of the infection and the lethality of it is troubling her, as it looks like nothing known by science. She again reiterates what she needs them to do. Identify it, work out a treatment plan, stop the spread and above all, do no harm. They are all aware that their career is at stake if this is a mess. It does suggest that Dr Marhone could offer two courses of action that the researchers could take. That of either locking it down like a full epidemic or keeping it calm to stop a panicked reaction. The obvious worst case scenario is that it is a weaponised pathogen which would imply an organised attack. She can also fill them in on Hudson's well, though a web search can also provide info. It's a small town of around 5,000 people, with light industry, mining and ranches. It's in Navajo country and has quite a gimmicky Indian theme about it. It has a community college and a hospital. The population is around 50% Native American, Navajo and Apache, and the other half white Mormons and Hispanics. There's no police department, though a county sheriff deputy is always here. Crime is fairly minor. Incidentally, the town is near a highway which could be closed off should the need arise. Manpower can be drawn from the county and state in the form of state troopers, who are trained in hazmat decontamination procedures, and Flagstaff Medical Centre is 150 kilometres west. They have around a half dozen doctors and nurses who will journey to Hudson's Well to assist. The researchers arrive around 5pm local time and are met at the hospital by Danica Thomas, a sheriff's deputy. She will stick with them as long as she can to assist and knows Hudson's Well intimately. She knows something's wrong at the hospital and that some people have locked themselves away at home, others fleeing the town, demanding to be seen at the hospital and avoiding it despite showing symptoms because they're scared. She wants to know if it's terrorism at work and if she needs a gas mask. The hospital itself, with floor plans here, is only one in name. It was gifted by a rich prospector in 1920 and is more a clinic than anything else. There's usually one nurse and doctor on duty on any given day and it doesn't have an ER or surgical ward. A few years ago a mining company bought them an MRI machine, though the radiologist who operates it can only do so twice weekly. The upper floor is normally used for storage. They have a decontamination line manned by off-duty volunteers outside the hospital, fully equipped with hazmat suits and the like. There are a number of patients at various stages of infection in isolation zones, and as they set foot in the hospital they can hear a patient at stage 3, Stephen Embry, screaming about being surrounded by lights and something trying to eat his eyes. Everyone who has died are stored in a refrigerated truck being loaned from a meatpacking plant outside of town. It gives us a rough map of Hudson's Well, showing all the important places in the scenario, and then talks about the medical staff here. There are two doctors, one nurse practitioner, and four registered nurses. As soon as Dr Strickland called the CDC, he also contacted Flagstaff for help. It lists all of the medical staff that have died or are infected, and at which stage, from Hudson's Well as well as those that came from Flagstaff. As soon as they arrive in Phoenix, the clock is ticking, and they'll have to pull together information, study the pathogen and its symptoms, work out a plan to treat it and stop it spreading, as well as getting rest and refreshments when they can. The way the scenario is designed this is that the researchers have time in four-hour blocks in which they can pursue one action. They can help each other with small things and rest, but the goal for that time period is singular. As these pursuits are happening, the disease is spreading, new patients are appearing and others are getting worse. Obviously time is of the essence here. They can of course conduct research on their way to Hudson's Well with a penalty. There is a spreadsheet which I'll show you later on which has the timeline of the hospital which is to be given to the players which I will talk about in a bit. It gives some rules for rest and exhaustion, and then we have a box out on quarantines and how they're normally managed by the CDC, where it discusses about the last large-scale quarantine being the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. It also makes the point that each time two or more adults die or one child, the researchers can lose sand from helplessness. It then moves on to research and developments. Here it talks about the developments at the hospital, including the current list of symptoms being displayed, as well as the infections that have come as unexpected. Even the hospital administrator, who is sat behind a glass window wearing gloves and a breathing mask, has managed to become infected somehow, and also a Flagstaff physician who has meticulously observed the hazmat routines. Okay, so now we move on to the researcher activities. This is broken down into four parts. Part one is entitled Researching Victims. The obvious first focus here is Dr Strickland who put out the distress call. If he's contacted before 3pm, then he will sound harried and afraid and want to know if they have identified the disease, and if not, why are they contacting him? After 3pm, calls will go to his voicemail as he is collapsed, but they can speak to another doctor, Angela Garcia from Flagstaff, who can let them know a few details. One of the infected, Ahmad Malouf, worked at the Kachina Cafe, and three patients purchased food and drink from there while Malouf was on duty. 
Police had closed it down and are attempting to track down records of who was served there during that particular shift on the 20th of November. An elderly lady called Philippa Jones died on the 21st as an ambulance was heading her way due to reports of a severe fever. She was at the Kachina Cafe on the 20th with her grandchildren and they've been quarantined but are showing no symptoms. Dr Strickland has used some different antivirals that have proven useless. This will help the researchers work out how to treat the disease. Also they mentioned that a nearby gym is being used as a voluntary quarantine and family and friends of the victims being watched by a nurse from Flagstaff. There have been no symptoms so far. Should they look into the background of the victims, they should ideally be observing patterns of movement. None of the victims had any movement that could be considered suspicious and all the people listed live in Hudson's well. If they look at the data of the geographic spread, they can get a sense of its movement. If they interview the victims and families, a lot can be discovered. Two can be conducted in a four-hour block. Some of what can be found out is essentially gossip. However, there are notable exceptions. Philippa Jones's daughter, Renee Simmons, went to her condo when she didn't show up to babysit her grandchildren. She found her passed out in a tub of cold water. They can discover that she took the grandchildren to the Kachina Cafe for coffee and donuts. The owner of the Kachina Cafe, Khalid and Brenda Rudel Malouf, can share the video footage from the inside of the cafe. They can identify Langsville as being ahead of Philippa Jones in the queue. Ahmad Malouf's family are devastated by his illness, thinking he was the reason people got sick, despite him swearing he took all precautions for cleanliness and safety. He told them that one of the customers looked pale, a man he didn't know. One family had lost two children the Maoris. They are numb with shock. If pressed to break through their grief, they can remember going door to door to solicit funds for a church pledge drive. She'll remember one woman opening the door and looking pale and ill. She lives three doors down from them, Rosamund Kayat. Should the belongings of the victims be searched, there is evidence in the form of suspicious texts from Harudo Cortez, who is having an affair with Hudson Well resident Geoffrey Langsville. So at some point they can look into Kayat and Langsville. The researchers can find out that Langsville retired from a professorship at Caltech in 2010 after 22 years and who worked on particle physics and expressions of time-space in his last few years. He is married to Rosamund Kayat. She was a physics professor at Caltech until 2009, whose dissertation was gravitino detection using chronal topography, a theoretical approach, though more information is hard to come by. A bit of digging can reveal that she was not popular among the students and had the reputation of being inept and was focused on something called a ghost particle. As time passed by, she didn't receive any recognition and became resentful, feeling that the physics establishment was holding her back. She grew more and more frustrated and single-minded about the potential promise of what she had discovered, hence she quit Caltech and moved to Hudson's Well with her husband, retiring in good standing and following her. If message boards dedicated to the study of physics are viewed, they can dig out posts about her becoming obsessed with the so-called Philadelphia experiment, the supposed disappearance of the USS Eldridge in 1943, something later debunked as a hoax. Should the researchers speak to the families of the victims and cross-reference them with their activities, it all points to them having contact in some way with Kayette and Langsville. Cortez can tell them that he sold the two of them their house in 2009, and if pressed in the right way, he will admit that he and Langsville became friends and later lovers. He said that they met for one last time on the 19th of November, and that Langsville was excited about a development he and his wife had made, saying no more. If Philippa Jones' grandchildren are shown a photograph of him, they will recognise him as the person standing in front of them at the Kachina Cafe. Somehow the children have not been infected. Okay, so the second activity that the researchers can do is in regard to symptoms and treatment. In one four-hour block, a researcher can work with medical staff to manage the symptoms and stall the progress of the disease. A medicine roll is needed, with varying results from a fumble meaning no help and a critical being that four patients stay at the same stage of infection. They can examine the victims to determine what the infection stems from and can easily rule out bacterial infections. If they can examine a stage 3 victim, then they will find that their retinas glow a dark violet colour under ultraviolet light and it lingers for around an hour after death. This can cause a minor sand hit. They can compare symptoms on various databases, which requires a variety of roles, and has a number of results from a fumble meaning that they get exposed to the disease, to a critical meaning that they work out that they can impede the spread by isolation. They can theorise about the symptoms and can come to the conclusion that it reminds them of meningitis and primary amoebic meningoencephalitis and has similarities to creutzfeldt jakob disease, though these are nowhere near as easily spreadable. The doctors at Hudson's Well have identified the three stages as laid out here. Another option is Strickland and Paulden. Strickland is isolated and fading fast. 
he can, in a weak manner, explain the situation and get the researchers up to speed. Essentially by 1pm he'd been on duty for 4 hours and was already starting to suffer. Around 3pm he took his own temperature and recorded it as 38 degrees. This made him realise he'd been exposed and he decided to isolate himself, realising it was highly contagious even though he had taken all precautions. Before this had happened, the Flagstaff radiologist and him had put Dr Paulden in their MRI. As the magnetic field spun up, Paulden started getting uncomfortable and eventually shrieking about black things in the sky, subsequently passing out and dying. If the MRI images are viewed, there are holes in the patient's medulla and brain stem before and after death. No more MRIs were conducted after that. Should the researchers want to conduct a CT scan on one of the victims, and can convince a patient or next of kin to one of the victims to have one, the results are not as spectacular as the MRI and show similar damage. If a researcher attempts to go beyond simply stopping the symptoms and spread, they can make a medicine roll with a variety of results, ranging from fumble meaning they are exposed, and anyone they're helping having to make a look roll or also being exposed, and a critical meaning using M2 ion channel inhibitors, with no apparent benefits. Should they choose to examine the infection, they can learn a great deal. There are seven discoveries which can be made, with each taking four hours, two with a critical, eight with a failure, and twelve with a fumble. The first is unknown microbes in the brain tissue of deceased victims. The second is that none of these microbes look exactly alike, resembling more of a colony of different distinct species. The third is that these microbes seem to be attracted to electrical signals, and can disrupt these signals in the brainstem. This worsens as the disease progresses. The fourth is that after the host dies, occasionally the microbes will dart at each other to devour it, but the other will vanish out of existence. The fifth is that sometimes a microbe will vanish and leave a cavity behind and then reappear somewhere else, recognisable as the same one due to their uniqueness. The sixth is that if the nervous system is thoroughly examined, a microbe will vanish and then reappear a metre away from where it disappeared. The seventh and final discovery can determine that in the brainstem of a victim 12 hours after death, none of the microbes remain. The third activity they can look at is other events. They can discover that there was an electrical brownout at lunchtime on Monday the 19th, which was explained as a substation power fluctuation, with normal service resumed that evening, and a call to Arizona Electrical Service showing that it was a substation a few blocks from the Kyat house. Should they look into it, they can arrange for a representative to show them the substation, though this could take a few days. The representative will give them a friendly tour and they will learn nothing new. Any researcher who has the disease and goes inside the substation will feel the likes of the nausea and the headache lift, with the closer they get to the power transmission lines making them feel even better. The symptoms will come back after a few minutes of leaving, though they will fade again if re-entered. If the representative is asked why there was an issue, they will explain that it started somewhere outside and was possibly due to a lightning strike, though none was recorded on that day. If pressed, he will trace the line the surge came in from to outside the Kyat house, where the pole shows clear signs of being scorched. The fourth activity the researchers can do is one of containment. It explains that simply looking into the illness is not enough, it needs to be prevented from spreading. This is tracked using containment points, which are kept a note of privately by the handler. Certain activities grant an amount of points. It presents us with four options, though it does mention considering other ones if they're plausible. They're tested against stats, with a fumble gaining zero and a critical gaining three. Each activity would use a four hour slot. The result of their action is revealed in the aftermath. More on that later. The first thing it suggests is to call the governor, Sarah Simonson, to implement roadblocks and air support. If they're successful, she deploys the state police to put up roadblocks in and out, though the National Guard has stepped too far, depending on the role. There are a variety of skills that can be used to convince her, however, if someone thinks to take a photograph of the dead Maori sisters and send it to her, they can instead attempt a Charisma Times 5 roll if this is higher. The results will range from a fumble doing little in the way of a response, with the researchers causing a political backlash if they push it, and could have them being fired, to a critical result in the Air National Guard and troops patrolling the quarantine zone. The next is to quarantine the city. This is the call of the county sheriff, Darren Remo. It has a political risk for him as the position is elected, and he will be out of penalty unless they have Deputy Thomas helping them make their case. A fumble will result in offence and panic, and has him issuing vague, confusing orders, which results in two people dying and people circumventing roadblocks, to a critical which has him listening carefully and being incredibly efficient. The third is a direct appeal to the public. Hudson's Well has an emergency broadcast system, and everyone there can be warned. This requires a persuade role with a bonus for those who have a high enough charisma. A fumble will cause mass panic, whereas a critical will get access to the wireless emergency system which will text everyone in the area. The final thing suggested is simply saving lives. 
This ranges from 20 plus deaths giving no points to 11 or fewer gaining 3. Ok, so with everything they can do as research is outlined, we move on to events that happen. The next section is called the FBI. Late on the Thursday evening of the 22nd of November, two FBI agents will arrive in town, flashing badges and telling all and sundry that this is now a federal investigation of a suspected bioweapon by a terrorist cell. They are actually Special Agents Neil Bouchard and Bradley Stusser from the Weapons of Mass Destruction Directorate's Investigations and Operations section. They come in and take possession of almost everything, all records, paperwork, etc, and tell the hospital staff not to discuss the outbreak with anybody and report back to them about anyone asking for details. Additionally, they ask the hospital and researchers to do breakdowns of their activities. They do not explain the reasons to anybody and are deadly serious, even having their own hazmat suit in a black SUV. They also have tactical shotguns with the finger guard removed. This is so they can be fired using gloves. If the researchers decide to investigate Bouchard and Stusser, they can get some odd results. Should they call the FBI and Flagstaff, they know nothing of them and advise them to call Phoenix. If Phoenix is called and they speak to the WMD field coordinator, she will be more annoyed that she has no details of the Hudson's well incident. If the right roles are made, she can inform them that the FBI headquarters in Washington overrode the normal command chain and sent two agents. If Washington is contacted, then the researchers will be stonewalled and told it's classified. What has actually happened is that Bouchard and Stusser are Delta Green agents, sent by the program to contain a suspected unnatural incursion. They will initially rely on the researchers to get a handle on vents, and then set about a plan to destroy the incursion and stop it spreading. We have another box out on naming Blank Pathy. Whoever makes the discovery that the microbes disrupt electrical signals has the time on a tradition of naming the disease. As explained earlier, this will be important soon. Ok, so if all the clues have been followed, then the physicist's house should be the top of their list to investigate. We have a map of the Kyat and Langsville house and then it goes into it. The couple essentially had a house that was too big for them, but made the investment based on the huge basement. Lots of rooms in the house are filled with scientific documents accumulated over the years, books, journals, computer parts, etc. The basement is well locked but can be bypassed using various methods and contains their lab. Should the Delta Green agents suspect anything with regard to the physicist's house, they will go there armed. The lab itself is as you might expect, tables loaded with strange exotic devices and the like, and a large metal machine with a circular aperture in the middle. If the researchers have a gag counter, then the room will have high levels of radiation. The machine is surrounded by various lenses, wires, probes and antennae aimed at it, as well as a camera. There are high energy coils, a capacitor and ultraviolet lasers that serve a purpose unknown to the researchers. The aperture is damaged, with a lot of the instrumentation thrust outwards as if something forced itself from the wall behind it. The wall is unmarked. The ultraviolet laser has incredibly sensitive gravity and electromagnetic sensors built in and are aimed in such a way that the beam will go through the area the instrumentation is pointed at. It's clearly a device that has a heavy power draw. In dim light or worse, the machine glows a sickly violet colour and anyone closely examining it has to pass a look check or catch the unknown disease. Obviously it no longer functions and taking the time to figure out why could potentially take weeks. The next thing it details is Kyat's office. There are a number of items in the lab that can provide clues and information on what has occurred here. The room itself is lined with physics texts, has a computer and strange wriggling stone tubes which a geology role can determine as being fulgurites, something that happens when lightning hits sand. The cabinet in here contains lab reports that are essentially a mystery to those without a deep understanding of physics and an electric typewriter. Also found here is Kyat's body. Examination will show that she took a massive overdose of oxycodone. She was at stage 2, had seen her husband die and wasn't going to suffer the same fate. The typewriter contains a handout that is essentially a suicide note and an apology. The note in the file cabinet can show with the right roles that Kaya was investigating something God in space-time, attempting to boost the phantom signal and has something to do with dimensional topography and the distortion of space. Further reading can determine that it worked by connecting two non-simultaneous events. Her last experiment, it appears, did more than that by opening a hole in space-time that opened for 0.00000000008 seconds and the size a bit bigger than the wavelength of a beam of light. In the bin in the room is a handout with a pizza place phone number on it and a doodle showing the TARDIS moving in a loop which is marked as nobody been able to go beyond a certain point. There's also a note where Kyat had written down his suspicions that a living time traveller had surged power into the experiment enough to widen it and keep it open longer than intended. She estimated that it had been open for 2.21 seconds, had stretched to 1.7 metres in size and used 22 billion petawatts of power. 
essentially around one-tenth of the power of the sun, wondering how that was even possible. There are also some hurriedly scrawled notes on how the metal in the room glowed violet. Next, we move to Langsville's office. There's a powerful desktop computer here that contains advanced physics and multimedia apps that was used to control the lab experiments. Langsville's body lies here on the floor arranged carefully by his wife. He shows signs of infection by the mystery disease, with wounds to his eyes and face that seem to be self-inflicted, though he actually has a broken neck. A forensic examination will show it was done by enormous hands. His tablet is not password protected and contains digital books and journals related to physics, as well as those dealing with conspiracy theory-esque materials such as the Philadelphia Experiment. He has also collected newspaper clippings from the 1940s dealing with sailors on the USS Eldridge between 1943 and 1944. His computer holds some video files. One of them is the arrival of Thartha, and the second an interview with her. They are described on handouts in detail. We also have a box out that talks about how the researchers could delve into the secrets of Majestic and Delta Green, mentioning Project Rainbow as a source. It talks about delving into Langsville's search history, showing you the physics or the purchase of the personal effects of dead sailors from World War II, and there is a photo frame on a wall containing an envelope addressed to a Peggy Connolly from a Commander Connolly on the USS Eldridge, dated the 15th of October 1942, that is empty. A deep dive of research can determine that there was a Captain Joseph M. Connolly, an executive officer on the USS Enterprise in the late 1960s, who died in 1974. His wife Peggy died in 2011, and their children sold off their mementos. On a shelf in the room is a cylindrical cardboard container that has a dictograph logo on it. It contains a wax cylinder. If someone can get a sound engineer with the right equipment to play it, it's around six minutes long and seems to have two interviews and one interviewee. It's a man with a heavy Brooklyn accent who is weeping and shouting about worm things floating in the air, passing through him and latching onto someone called Finney like a leech. Next, it details the time traveller, Thartha. She should only be found after the lab and officers has been searched and can be heard moving around upstairs. She's 2.3 metres tall and around 120 kilograms, with almond-shaped brown eyes and brown hair in a braid with dark tan skin. She has angular features, high cheekbones and a pointed chin with a straight long nose and narrow nostrils. She has normal proportions. She's just exceptionally tall. She's wearing a grey coverall seemingly made of cotton or canvas that has no jewellery or ornamentation and has bare leathery feet. She knows that she's responsible for the disease and thinks Langsville spread it. She wants to sneak away by night and try to survive but has yet to gather the courage to do so. She's terrified of strangers in hazmat suits and will fight if cornered. Anyone who fights her physically has to make a luck roll or catch the unknown disease. Should Bouchard and Stusser track her down, they will kill her on sight unless in public, otherwise chasing her somewhere private to do so. If Thartha's corpse is examined, her coverall will thin as it's handled and is actually temperature sensitive, expanding when cold and thinning when warm. Her proportions can be determined as within normal standards and not showing any medical abnormalities such as Marfan syndrome and the like. She has rough hands and extremely thick-skinned feet, with a strange toe configuration that has her big toe separating from the foot much higher than normal. It appears partially prehensile. The toenails curve under her toes and are really tough and thick. Her face has tattooed lines on it, and there are no signs of tan lines or facial piercings, and her teeth are like baby teeth. She also has another tattoo on her left bicep. It's the name of the disease that the researchers have coined, followed by the number 2.17.25. This gives them a sand hit from the unnatural. If an in times 5 is rolled, the researchers can understand that the disease looks to have been generated from the time loop, creating an epidemic strong enough that she was inoculated before time travelling. This causes a further bigger sand hit. If an autopsy is performed, an alertness roll will notice that the skin opens up spontaneously before the scalpel can cut it and then some of the bones are made from a kind of extremely tough plastic or resin. It appears to reinforce the bones and doesn't interfere with scans. If a brain is studied, the microbes are present there, however they do no harm and swim and blink about having no effect on the tissue. It can be discovered that air tissue carries strange patterns of electricity that occasionally surge on areas that have infestations of microbes giving a further hint that it's electricity that is the best treatment. As the researchers go on with the autopsy, a strange force causes Thartha's sternum to erupt in a violet flash. Any researchers caught in this is encased along with Thartha in a strange spatial anomaly and then compressed out of our dimension with a deafening pop. This, of course, causes a sand hit. The next section is called debriefing. Providing the researchers have confronted Thartha, Bouchard and Stusser, or even their case officer if both have died, they will attempt to convince the researchers of the importance of keeping their discovery a secret, as what they have witnessed could rewrite medicine and physics. 
They would be reminded of the threat that many more people could die. The disease is from the future and thus, with everyone who carried it either dead or cured, there is no vector for carrying it. Protecting the public and keeping them ignorant means burying the whole thing. Should the researchers remain unconvinced, then the Delta Green agents will take on a grim tone. They intend to destroy all of the work of the physicists and the existence of Tharthar and will ensure that those researchers making things public are met with the kind of scorn and ridicule that will end their careers. The agents will rope in the police to establish a quarantine around the physicist's house and CDC biocontainment experts will arrive to wrap the building in plastic and keep the public away. So then we move on to the aftermath. How successful they were at containing the disease comes into play by adding up all of the points that they have accumulated throughout. If it's zero containment, the disease spreads to nearby towns affecting around 2,900 people, with 762 deaths and 817 suffering damage enough to handicap them. Conspiracy theories abound that this is a germ warfare attack on the native population or Mormons. The mishandling of the outbreak ensures Senate hearings with the restructure of the CDC. Marholm will make sure to take the whole team down with her, though one of them may emerge unscathed and possibly recruited by the programme if they behaved in a proper manner, though the public will not forget them, walking out of the hearing unpunished. All researchers face being fired or even prosecuted. The disease will have an outbreak monthly for the next year, spreading through the Americas, and then after that there are monthly global outbreaks, killing smaller amounts in developed nations but much more in the developing world. The researchers take a small sand here from the weight of responsibility. If they get one to three points, Hudson's Well has 504 cases, 45 deaths and 20 people with disabilities, with a scattering of other cases throughout the country. It dominates the headlines for a few days and causes political unrest as a witch hunt ensues. Marholm was forced out of a job, though insists the team did everything they could, but the researchers may be blacklisted from government service. Over the next three months, there are outbreaks throughout the US, and the Americas the following year after. The year after that, there are outbreaks every six months globally. If four to six points are garnered, the death toll in Hudson's Well is 30, with a further five cases causing some lack of function. The disease looks to have died out, however pops up in Guam 18 months later, travelling around the Pacific Rim for a year or two, killing around 100 people at a time. Around 10 years later, it'll pop up once a year, somewhere, killing 100 to 250 people. Hudson's Well steals the headlines for a week or so. Survivors will be interviewed for a big-budget documentary about the outbreak, though comments about time-travelling Amazonians will be removed. Those researchers who survived gain a bond in Dr. Marholm and D4 San. If they have 7 to 8 points, only the patients in the hospital are stage 3 die. There's another outbreak eight months later in Mexico that kills 20, followed by an outbreak annually somewhere, though the UN has a pretty good task force for dealing with it maybe led by a researcher or Dr. Marholm. This keeps fatalities at around 10 to 100 in sparsely populated areas, or 20 to 500 in dense populations. Press coverage is broad but short. The researchers are invited to Washington DC to meet the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and they all gain Dr. Marholm as a bond and a plus 10% permanent increase to their bureaucracy skill due to their reputation, as long as the weird stuff is left out, and they gain D6San. At 9 plus points, such a good job is done that outside of the CDC, few know how, how well they did. They get nice pay rises and commendations. The disease becomes a trivia question, and everything is locked away in a vault. They gain 2D4 San. In addition to all of this, what becomes of them depends on how they reacted to Bouchard and Stusser in covering up the unnatural. If they don't cooperate, they are publicly discredited despite Marholm trying to shield them. Their ludicrous claims make the CDC look foolish and they get fired. Doctors that end up with this fate take public share of the blame for Hudson's well. If they continue to go public, they are trampled on even more in the press and social media and get cyber harassed and have threatening phone calls. They take a minor sand hit and damage to a bond. If they continue to push going public, they need to roll on this table. Something bad will happen to them. This can range from being framed, arrested and convicted for the possession of child pornography to them being found dead in an apparent suicide from a fentanyl overdose. If they reluctantly cooperate, they'll be informed that it is a smart choice and are tagged as a possible recruit. If they willingly cooperate, the agents seem relieved and that someone may be in touch. They are tagged for Delta Green recruitment. After this, we have all of the NPCs in the scenario, including the time traveller Thartha. There's a map of Hudson's Well, Kyat's suicide note, as well as the hair doodle and memo. There's a descriptive piece of the text of Thartha's appearance, gleaned from the video files they find, and a transcript of the interview with Thartha, which makes a very interesting read, hinting at some awful things that happen in the future. There's also information on PPE equipment, as well as three handouts that serve as reminders for the stages of the disease, naming the disease and a list of all medical staff. After this, we have a mound of sheets for the researchers to keep an hour-by-hour record of their activities on, as well as a list of contagion developments, which contains information on when each patient hits the various stage and dies. Finally, we have a list of the pre-gen characters. 
Sick Again is for me a mixed bag. The idea of being part of a team that is sent to essentially stop a mystery disease is a good one, and the really well-researched advice on how to go about it is well done. However, there are some issues. All evidence points ultimately towards the residents of the physicists, and yet only one of the pregens has an actual skill in physics, making it essentially an all-or-nothing to gain information on what Kyat and Langsville were up to. In addition, the researcher notes take up far too much room in the book for what they are, and a problem my own group had with the patient developments is that it lists people that are actually yet to die, as dying at specific times. This prompted them to use their four-hour slot to prevent one of the patients from dying as a way of messing with what they saw as a preordained set of events. That's not to say it doesn't have some great bits, because it does. Thartha is a fascinating character, and an interview and the video of her emerging from the time hole prompted much discussion from my own group, as the potential events of the future spoken in her own kind of pig in English into terrible, terrible things. Also, the twist of Thartha's tattoo is really well realised, and I had to stop my players in the tracks as the gravity of the situation sunk in, and the burn and purge nature of the two Delta Green agents felt very fitting to the situation. My main issue, however, is the sheer amount of bookkeeping that the handle has to deal with. You could potentially have multiple characters doing different things, legitimately splintering the party and dragging things out far more than could be deemed in the realm of fun. And as usual, some character portraits wouldn't have gone amiss. As a way of serving Control Group as a whole, Sick again accomplishes what it set out to do by introducing the researchers to possibilities beyond their capability of understanding and exposing them to a wider universe of the thankless task that Delta Green has to stop the unnatural. I give it a 7 out of 10. The next video in this series will be the fourth and final scenario, Wormwood Arena. So until then, if you enjoyed this review, please make sure to hit the thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and check out my other videos. Also, if you're interested in buying this product, I'll put some links below. Lastly, if you like what I produce here, then maybe think about supporting me on Patreon, or even becoming a member of my YouTube channel. But out.